Good morning, The Rock. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. We're still in the season of Easter, and it's great to be with you again in worship this morning in your living room or wherever you are at today on this May the 10th, this Mother's Day. My name is Mike, and I get to be the pastor here at The Rock of what we call our forever family, since that is what we are through faith in Jesus And like I said, it is Mother's Day, so we want to wish a happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there, wherever you may be. And we pray that you have a great day of celebration, maybe some time to relax, perhaps get a little bit pampered and enjoy the day. And yet also, we know that for some on this Mother's Day, it, it is a tough day. And it's a tough day for some because of perhaps maybe, well the separation that is caused by the, the, the day between moms and, and children, or maybe it's some grief that's associated with that, or perhaps maybe, I don't know, a, a difference of opinion, or perhaps there's some moms that, some, some young ladies that want to be moms and can't be moms. So we just want you to know today that if that's you, or today is a tough day, that, that we love you. And not only do we love you, but God loves you, and, and we want to wish you still today a happy Mother's Day. So this morning, I want to remind you of that, those numbers and information contacts on the screen there, that if you want a conversation or, 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 or need to talk or you have some questions or, or a need of a specific prayer request, request or would like to be prayed with, Let's get together by using those contact information pieces up there on your screen, those three uh, pieces up there. One of the things that I want to remind you of is, as you know, we've made a, a decision tentatively, the leaders of The Rock, to tentatively resume public worship on, on June 7th. Again, I have to stress that word, tentatively, because things can can change. It could either be earlier or longer. But in the meantime, your ambassadors at The Rock are right now crafting a plan to offer a drive through type style uh, Holy Communion opportunity for you. So watch for more details to come about that in the days ahead. All right, I think that's all in the way of announcements for this morning. Let's move to our theme verse for today, which is from Ephesians chapter 3. And I invite you to speak this with me. And I pray that your love will have deep roots. I pray that it will have a strong foundation. 
may you have power with all God's people to understand Christ's love. And may you know how wide and long and high and deep it is. And may you know his love, even though it can't be completely known. And we'll talk more about that in our, in our message time for today. But let's now confess our Christian faith in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit using these words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I've carried this burden for too long. I have turned from you, and my heart has turned to stone. You say your yoke is easy, yet I carry it still. You say your burden is light, yet I carry it still. You say you will give me rest, yet I carry it still. Lower my vengeance, my anger, and my hatred, and banish my wicked thoughts from me. Send down a drop from heaven of your Holy Spirit to soften this heart of rock of mine. Give me the strength to let go. Provide no shelter for grievance against another. Let my heart provide no harbor for hatred of another. Let my tongue be no accomplice in the judgment of a brother. Give me the strength to surrender. Give me the strength to be weak, to let go, and not pick it up again. So what are you holding on to today? What burden are you carrying with you that's, that's weighing you down? I mean, I've only been carrying this, this big boulder for just a little bit, and I already can feel the fatigue start to come into my arms and my shoulders, and it, and it sure would be nice to let go. But yet, isn't that often what we do with our sins? We, we, we hold on to them, and we build up that guilt and that shame, and and all of those emotions that go with it, and we just wish to be freed of it. Well, as the video reminded us, we can let go. 
that as we confess our sin today, Jesus removes this burden of this, this guilt and the shame of our sin. This burden can be removed. We can be freed of it in his life, death, and resurrection. So would you pray with me a prayer of a confession? Father in heaven, we need to be, we need to have this this burden of sin removed. We've been holding on to it for way too long. Even if it's just a matter of hours or days, it's way too long. And so, in your gift of prayer right now, we confess those sins, those things we've been holding on to as failures and shortcomings and offenses against you. Forgive us, Father. Empower us to believe in the forgiveness that you give us in Jesus so that we can let go of those sins and be free. In the strong and precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Romans 8 says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, The power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent His own Son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving His Son as a sacrifice for our sins. Jesus took the burden and the weight and the guilt and the shame of your sin and mine and took it to the cross. It was nailed there and buried with him in the tomb. And it's gone. Lifted off of you, taken away from you. And you're free. So as your pastor, it's my privilege to proclaim to you and remind you that you are set free from your sin. You're forgiven in the strong and precious name of Jesus. Amen.
the grace in his eyes If grace is an ocean where all sinking So heaven needs a life to stop me with kissing My heart turns violently inside of my chest I don't have the time to maintain this grudge when I think about the way So over the past two weeks, we have been in this series called Love Does, and again, it's, it's been based off of what God tells us about love in the Bible, but also some of the concepts that Christian author Bob Goff puts forth in his book called Love Does. And uh, it wasn't until just a, a few weeks ago, as I was looking at the book, I noticed that the subtitle of Bob Goff's book is pretty engaging. It says, discover a secretly incredible life in an ordinary world. How engaging is that? Uh, discover the secretly incredible life in an ordinary world. Because as Goff goes on to say, as, as we have talked about the past two weeks, that love is not a novel that you write or a song that you sing or an emotion that you feel. Love is in action. And love motivates and empowers and fills people up and moves them forward in life to do all kinds of amazing and incredible things. We've talked about how love is present with us and how love is present through us also. And last week we talked about how that peculiar action of love and, and failure go together and how we can rise above those failures and allow God's grace to work in us and through us to demonstrate how God doesn't waste anything, how he turns our failures into successes, all by the power of that unconditional everlasting love that he moves in and through us. So today, as we move forward in Love Does... And talk about that love as an action word, something that we do. We're going to talk about love being audacious today. You've probably heard the word audacity referring to someone as being maybe bold or outrageous or, or maybe risk-taking. And yet that is exactly what kind of love God has for us. I mean, have you ever noticed that, that real love involves big risks? I mean, I have. I can remember back to the days when I was getting ready to ask my now wife out on the first date. And I can tell you, I felt a lot of nerves in there. And I thought, man, this could go right. This could go all wrong. And I was focusing on all the ways it could go wrong. And I was thinking, man, this is pretty risky. And then as the relationship grew, and she did agree to go out with me, and we went on several more dates, then the next question arose that even presented itself more, more risk in my mind, that question of, will you marry me? It's just risky. Got my, my blood pressure up. I didn't know what was going to happen. But yet, real love takes those risks. And I got to thinking about how real love comes into play and that aud audacity or audaciousness of love comes into play with, with my kids. You know, two times now I've, 
I've uh, packed up my kids' stuff and taken them off to college, and I was reminded that of that again. You know, just this last fall, we did that for the second time in moving Caleb to college, and each time, this grown man of 50-some years old has shed some tears when he had to leave our kids at college because you don't know what's going to happen to them. You, you hope that they'll be okay, that they'll make dis- the right decisions, that they'll, that they'll still rely on the promises of God. And that you have to let them grow as you let them go. And so it's important for us today that we understand this truth about love, that because love is other-focused, it's, it's filled with risk. And if you, if you aren't taking any risks and you're playing it safe, it's probably not real love. Because real love involves risks. Real love is bold. And that's the kind of love God has for us. God doesn't have any problems with being risky or being bold. That's where our theme verse from Ephesians 3 comes in for today. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Isn't that incredible? It's this, it's this, this overarching love that is that is all-encompassing and even incomprehensible. It's, it's so amazing. This is the love that God has for you and me in Jesus. And it's the same love that Jesus models to his disciples and to the world that he models to you and me because he and the Father are one. And that brings us to the part of the Bible that we want to talk about today is from uh, John chapter 4. It's a familiar story of the woman at the well. We talked about the woman at the well a few weeks ago and how she led this scandalous life or or what was considered a scandalous life at at, uh, her time in history and in the culture in which she lived. Come to find out that that she had to go to the well in the middle of the day because of she was because she was such a letting leading such a scandalous life and and then Jesus a, a, a Jewish man is there in the middle of the day and, and not only do Jews don't talk to Samaritans but definitely not if it's a male and female in the middle of the day and come to find out she's had. Um, all kinds of, uh, of husbands, and yet through this interaction, engaging questions that, that she has with Jesus, and he knows things about her that, 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 that nobody should know, and she comes to believe in Jesus as the Messiah of the world and runs back into town to tell everybody uh, about it. And so I just want to summarize that story f- for you for a little bit before we dive into it and kind of unpack it a little bit in pieces to to really understand this audacious love of God that he has for people. So um, I want to do that by starting off at John chapter 4, verse 4. It says, Jesus had to travel through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the property that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. And I've underlined for you there in that text that Jesus had to go to Samaria. And I think that's significant, because, and I want to explain to you why. Because here in this uh, map of Israel, you have Judea in the south and Galilee in the north. Jews live in Judea, Jews live in Galilee, and then you have Samaria in the middle. And guess who lives in Samaria? Samaritans. And so if you were a Jewish person traveling from the south at Ephraim there, you would have two choices to make. You could go straight through through the, through the Green Arrow, a journey which would take you about three days, or you could take the route that is denoted by the Red Arrow across the Jordan River on the east, go up to the north, and then 
cross back over the Jordan River on the north side so that you wouldn't have to go through Samaria. Now, why was this a big deal? Because remember, Jews and Samaritans did not like one another. They hated each other in that time and period of culture. If you traveled through Samaria, it was dangerous, and you'd have to be around those people, and that wasn't something that Jewish people wanted to do, nor did Samaritan people want to do. So the most of the people, if you were traveling from south to north, you wouldn't take the green route. You'd take the red route, even though it would t- take you twice as long. But yet in our verse that we just read from John chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Jesus had to travel through Samaria. Now, why did he have to go? Because I've just shown you there's another route. I mean, this is a big deal because, like I said, Jews and Samaritans didn't like each other. They avoided each each other. But this part of the Bible says that Jesus had to go this way. Well, as I got to looking at this and unpacking this a little bit, I saw that that original word that's translated as had to go, you know, had to go, it, it, it's an imperative. It, it's used in other parts of the Bible to describe a divine urgency or, or the fact that something needs to happen or is going to happen. And that's why Jesus had to go this way. Because God was going to do something. God had scheduled this appointment for Jesus. And we see this in in other parts of the Bible. For instance, earlier in John chapter 3, we see this, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. You see, it had to happen. Jesus had to be lifted up on that cross. It's that same imperative used here in John 3 is the same one that used in in John 4. So what does all this mean? Well, God had this set up in advance. And Jesus goes through Samaria. He had to go through there to meet this woman at the well. And I mean, I mean, we're going to skip to the chase a little bit here, but so Jesus goes to, to this well and talks about, talks with this Samaritan woman, and there's an exchange there, and she's blown away that he knows the things that he does about her, and she comes to believe, she's convinced that he, he's the Messiah, and, and she goes to tell everybody in town about this, Literally. And then later on in, in, in chapter 4, this is, this is what it said. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. And they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. You see, because God's love is so audacious, it goes out of its way into places perhaps no one else would go, to people that perhaps others considered unlovable, so that they would know him, so that they would know him as the one who brings Jesus as the Savior of the world. This love of God is so audacious that, that, that no one is too far away from him and no one should be without hope. No one is beyond hope because of this God who loves so audaciously in Jesus. And you know what? The same audacious God who loves us with that audacious love, he makes divine appointments today just like he did For his own son, Jesus, with that woman at the well, he does that today through you and I. Brings that audacious love to others through us. That we get the privilege of introducing others to him. You know, there's one other important thing about this encounter that I think is is, uh, important for us to remember and and not forget is the the fact that uh, Jesus 
comes to this well in the middle of the day. He's hot, he's tired, and he's thirsty. This is the same Jesus who is fully God, yet he's God in human flesh. He he doesn't really need anybody to give him anything. He has all power to have anything and everything that he wants, but yet he doesn't. He sets it aside and, and he asks for a drink. He's thirsty. He's tired. He's worn out, that text said just before. Because remember, I I want you to hear this, that remember that we don't have a God who doesn't know what it's like to be a human. Another part of the Bible in Hebrews says we have a God who sympathizes with our weakness because he was one of us yet without sin. Jesus knows what it's like to be be fearful, to, to be hungry, to be thirsty, to not know what's going to happen next. He knows the issues, hardships, and troubles that we face in life. He knows what it's like to be human. And so he sits down by this well. In John chapter 4, verse uh, 7, we see this. A a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because the disciples had gone to town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, asked for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, she asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. I think this is just incredible because not only do we have Jesus sitting there in the middle of the day talking to a woman, which is totally a no-no in this culture, as well as the fact that this woman is coming out to the well in the middle of the day, which is because she has a scandalous life, which all points to this interaction here that's going on between Jesus and this woman where He's asking her a question, and she's surprised that he asks her this, this question or asks for a drink, and then she's not expecting him to talk to her in the first place, and he shouldn't be expecting her to, to respond in the, in the first place, and yet Jesus keeps engaging her. See all the stuff that's going on underlining, underlying here in this culture, and at this time, this interaction with Jesus? And he keeps going. He asks her engaging questions. You know, we do that a lot of times too in our, in, in our relationships, don't we? That we don't just want to ask a question that gives a yes-no answer. Like, like for instance, hey, do you, do you have uh, children? Well, somebody can answer that yes or no. Instead, you would ask maybe, hey, could you tell me a little bit about your family? And you see, this is what Jesus does in this story, the woman of the well. He engages her because ultimately he wants to to tell her about something better than well water. He wants to change her life. As I said a few weeks ago, um, Jesus isn't, isn't concerned about saving face. He's not concerned about how scandalous her her life is or whether he should be talking to her or not be talking to her because he's a man and she's a woman or he's a Jew and she's a Samaritan. He's not concerned about saving face. He wants to give her grace and he wants to give her hope. He wants to, through his words of life, change her life. So Jesus says in John chapter 4, Everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. See, Jesus promises a different kind of water to her that he can't draw from a well. And probably she's thinking, well, if you can give me this water, why are you even drinking? Why are you drinking the water that I'm giving you anyway? But yet he claims that there's something about this water that is different, that is amazing, that is transformative. And so in the few minutes that we have left today, I want to uh, go through three things that is Jesus' wonderful way of hydrating us. So you might want to write these down or put these in your phone, however uh, you want to do it. But we're going to start with number one. Is the, the number one or the first way that Jesus' uh, wonderful way of hydrating us is that it is once for all. It is once for all. John chapter 4, 14, where Jesus said, whoever drinks in the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. 
Now, we know that uh, you can't just drink water once for your physical body and think that you're hydrated. You have to keep drinking water again and again periodically. The water that you and I drink is only for this temporary life. But Jesus gives a different kind of water. And this kind of water that Jesus says he gives is that one time is enough. One time that you drink it in will last you forever. Getting this one-time dose of water helps us to understand a little bit better some of the other things that the Bible talks to us about, the things that God gives us through Jesus, the things that we hear about in the Bible. In 1 Peter chapter, chapter 3, it says, Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. And then the writer of of Peter goes on to say this, baptism now saves you. He relates it to baptism, not as the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, what God gives us in Jesus, what we need to understand as well as believe, is that what God gives us in Jesus is enough. It's more than enough. When Jesus paid the price for your sins and my sins and the sins of the world on the cross, it it was enough. He lifted away the burden of guilt and shame over our past mistakes. You don't have to carry that anymore. The once and for all sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is enough for you, for me, and the world. And we don't have to worry about having enough in this world to survive, especially in uncertain times in which we live. And because we belong to Jesus, he promises that he will provide for our every need. That's what Philippians 4 reminds us here. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches in the glory in Christ Jesus. God will supply all that we need. So we don't have to have guilt over our past mistakes. We don't have to worry about having enough. And this audacious love that we have in Jesus gives us the ability to love others. We talked about that last week, to be first steppers when we've hurt others, to allow God's grace not only to work in us, but also to let it work through others. Let it flow from Jesus to us and then through us. So number one, it is once and for all. Number two, Jesus' wonderful way of hydrating us, the second way is that it lives in us. John chapter 4, Jesus said, The water I will give him will become a well of water springing up to eternal life. You know, in the, in the Middle East, water is a big deal because where there's water, there is life, and there's life wherever it flows. And I have a friend that went to Israel a few years ago, and they were in the area of, of where the, the tribe of Dan settled. And there's this picture of this spring, one of these springs that literally starts and comes out of this big, huge rock, and it just rolls down its spillway, and it, is, it just has this powerful sound that, that, that you can hear as it rolls along and then empties out into this vast area. You can see the, the power of that water in the background and then all the life that's around it as it begins to gently flow down its, its path. And it creates life through this area. Living water flows out of our rock, Jesus, and through us. Each and every one of us through faith in Jesus has that. And, and sometimes... Sometimes we, we just don't know it, but yet it's important that we do. Especially in those times like, like, like during an illness, that we know and believe that in Jesus 
we have a store of strength, this living water that is, this, this spring of living water that is in us, flowing through us and, and out of us. And during stressful times, when there is trouble, we have a refuge. Because that wellspring of water, that rock of Jesus is our foundation. We have a refuge. Like we've said in the past, yes, the trouble is real and present, but so is the refuge in Jesus. And during crazy cultural times, who knows what the next thing that's going to come up that's going to challenge us in the truths of the Bible. But when we have are experiencing cultural times that are crazy, we have that rock-solid foundation in Jesus, our wellspring of water in us. It flows through us. It's a part of us. It is in us. You know, this being Mother's Day, it got me thinking about all the things that my mom has taught me that have stuck with me. I mean, my mom has taught me, my mom taught me how to cook. She taught me how to how to do the dishes, how to do my own laundry, how to fold it, and countless other kinds of things. My mom has showed me how to love when love is tough. And you know, as I've started to raise my own kids, I've found myself, as I've gotten older, passing on some of those same things that my mom has taught me in all those areas and even more than I just mentioned. Is it's a part of me, and it passes on through me to my kids. And it's changed me for the better. You know, that's what we hear in this story of, of Jesus and this woman at the well, because this conversation that Jesus has with her, it not only changes her, but it changes and transforms an entire community. In in John chapter 4, verse 28, Then the woman left her water jar, went into town, and told the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They left town and made their way to him. You know, and as we found out earlier in in the story and in the text, Jesus, in fact, did stay uh, 10 days and he taught them and he demonstrated that love and compassion, that audacious love of God, told them that they weren't beyond hope, that they weren't beyond God's love, that there wasn't anything to this, this racial divide, that God loves all people, including them, and wanted them to inherit eternal life. And they believed. So, number two, it lives in us. Number one, it is once for all. And here's the last one. It is infused with hope. It's infused with hope. I don't know if you're like me, if you've ever experienced one of these. I like that that water that you can... uh, make or sometimes you can get that is infused with like lime juice or or lemon juice. I think that's a perfect combination. I like limes, I like lemons, and I need to drink more water than I do, but I like water, but it seems like the perfect combination. And this water that Jesus gives you and me that he gave this woman is infused with hope. He said again, the water I will give him will become a wellspring of water springing up in him for eternal life. This hope that Jesus brings to her and to you and to me is for eternal life. This living water, this wellspring of water gives us a hope and a future. And the Bible reminds us that hope does not disappoint us. It's just fascinating that Jesus asked this woman for help with water, but it wasn't because that he needed her. It's ultimately because she needed him. She needed what Jesus had to offer her, even if she didn't know it at the time. 
And what Jesus gives us is that hope that leads to eternal life. And let's be clear on one thing, that this eternal life, this hope that Jesus gives, it is not something that you earn. It's not something that you buy. It's not something that this woman could pull up in a bucket. Neither can you or I. You can't work for it. It's a free gift, a gift given by the God of the universe through his Son, the Savior of the world, Jesus. It's free and clear. In fact, Jesus said this in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. He would give more than this woman ever asked for or imagined. And he can do the same thing to you and me. Jesus offers this even when she doesn't know she needs it. And the same is true for you and me. My friends in, in, in Christ, we have that same opportunity in Jesus. Jesus who knows us by name, has marked us with his cross, who has called us into his family forever through our baptism in his name, knows our needs and has the power that he can do anything. And he asks us to use his gift of prayer to ask him for anything. He doesn't ask us, he commands us. Ask me, what do you need? This woman got more from Jesus than she even knew that she needed at the well that day. What about you? Do you know what you need from Jesus today? Have you asked him for that? Or have you said, Jesus, this is what I think I need, but I want it to be what you need. Can you please show me? Have you done that? You know, so often in our culture, we as Americans have that mindset that we are supposed to be self-made men and women, right? Pull ourselves up from our bootstraps. Work through it. We can do anything. We can face any challenge. But you know what? I don't think that's what Jesus is concerned about. I think the best thing that we can do for our families and our friends and other people that we're in relationship with is... is not be a self-made man or woman, but, but be a Jesus-made man or woman. Because when, when Jesus audaciously loves your family or your friend or someone that you're in relationship with, when he loves them audaciously through you, it changes and transforms everything into something amazing. You know, a few months ago, we provided you with a resource called The Family Altar, where faith and family meet. And I think this is a good time to bring back this resource because as we talk about passing on the audacious love of God in Jesus to others as we receive it and it goes through us into them. This is a perfect opportunity to use this resource because in the times that we're living in right now today, the the altar isn't right now here at the rock. The altar is in your living room or wherever you're at. at. And that's where, where faith is being formed where faith is, is being put into action. In fact, in Deuteronomy 6, God says that the primary faith teachers 
are the ones that are in the home, moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, to, to teach that to their children. Teach them how to follow Jesus. And one who follows Jesus is a disciple. And so I would encourage you that, that as you're looking at this screen right now to maybe take a picture of that with your phone or look for this resource that we will make available on our web page and on our Facebook page that you can download again and make use of. You can ask these questions right after the, our, our worship today. You know, what, what was the one thing about the sermon that stuck with you? What grabbed your attention? You know, how can you put it into practice this week? Talk about that. Discuss that with your family and with your friends. Maybe you even want to ask somebody to hold you accountable to putting it into practice. Because you see, we're all leaving a legacy of faith with whoever we're in relationship with. So what does that legacy look like? Is it a legacy that just provides hope one day at a time? Or is it a legacy that provides hope for eternity? I pray that that audacious love of Jesus would cause you to strive to bring hope that lasts for eternity because that's what love does. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask today that as we have learned more about your love and the fact that it is so audacious and bold and risky, that we also realize how valuable you see that we are and how you want us a part of your family forever. That's why you sent Jesus. So Lord, today, may we drink deeply from that life-giving water that Jesus gives. And, and the spring of water that wells up in us will, will, we pray, leave a legacy of faith in Jesus that, that changes our families, our friends, our relationships, and even changes and transforms our world into a world that honors you with all that they think, say, and do. This we pray in the strong and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, Forever Family at The Rock. This is Scott Sievers, and it's my pleasure today during our offering to share with you that we now have three different options or pathways for you to submit your tithes and offerings to the ministry of the congregation in the kingdom of God. First, of course, is the standard pathway of mailing a check to the Rock's address. New this week is an opportunity to submit a donation online by going to the Rock's website and clicking on the Give Now button. That will take you to In Faith Community Foundation, a partner, a nonprofit partner of Thrivent Financial, that will process your gift via debit card or credit card or automatic fund transfer from your checking account directly to The Rock. A third and final option would be for you to go to the App Store and download the Give Plus app. Once again, if you select The Rock Lutheran Church and select the Give Now option, you will be able to enter information that will allow you to make an, a donation from the app that will go directly to The Rock. Thank you so much for your generosity, and I encourage you to try out one of these new pathways this week as you make your contributions to the congregation. God's blessings. Mother's Day looks a lot different this year. <sighs> Mommy needs a quarantine. And our moms may be spending a lot of time with their kids right now. A lot. Like, so, so much time. And even though they love their kids to the moon and back, Mommy! Where are you going? Sometimes moms need a little alone time. Mommy! 
you know, to recharge. Go talk to Daddy. But no matter what's happening in the world, their favorite way to spend time is with their family. In good times, in hard times. Mom! Hi. You're breaking everything! In uncertain times. Thank you, Mom, for making time for us every single day. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I ask that you would watch over us as we go to bed and rest, that you'd speak to us in Bible stories and speak to us in... Um... Would you please pray with me? Gracious God and Father, we thank you that you call us your very own children, and that we in turn can call you our Father, who is so, so good to us, as we sang moments ago. Lord, we're coming to you now in your gift of prayer at your command, at your request, and know that you promise to hear us always in Jesus and, and give us what we need in the way and timing that is just right in our lives. Lord, today we pray that, that you would provide the peace and comfort that only you can give to all those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. Today we pray that resurrection peace and comfort be given to Tim and his family as they mourn the death of his mother. We thank you for the life that she lived among them, a life lived in faith that demonstrate, demonstrated your audacious love. A life that has now been lived in faith and, and now been given the crown of life. Lord, May they trust in those promises of yours in Jesus, that through faith in him, we too will see Jesus face to face and our loved ones who have gone before us and meet them in heaven. Be their comfort and their strength. Lord, also be the comfort and strength of those who are, who are battling sickness and, and disease and in all kinds of things, whether that be mentally or physically or emotionally. Lord, today we especially ask for your healing and strength to be with Holly and Megan and Betty and, and Jason and all those that we name on our hearts right now. You are the great physician, Lord. Heal them in just the right way and in just the right time according to your grace. Lord, we thank you for the rain that you have uh, graciously poured out on our land in the past days and weeks. And thank you for providing uh, a window of opportunity for our area farmers to plant the crops that they are planting for the sustenance of their families as well as our country and world. Lord, grant them continued safety to finish up the planting process, and we pray that you would provide uh, a growing season that is favorable so that a bountiful harvest could be taken in the fall. 
And Lord, we continue to pray for those who are affected by this pandemic, those who are struggling with with loneliness, those who are confused, those who are frustrated, those who are out of work, those who desire to go back to work, those who are separated from family members and activities and adventures together outside of their home. Lord, give us your peace as we navigate closer and closer to the day when this pandemic will be through and we will be able to enjoy the freedoms that we are more accustomed to in our country. Lord, we again pray that you would deliver a vaccine in a short period of time and that you would heal all who are affected by this virus, that you would be with all first responders and those who are providing care in so many different ways. Give them strength and protection and courage. These things and whatever else you would have us ask, we bring before you in the strong and precious name of Jesus as he has taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please speak with me our theme verse for today from Ephesians chapter 3. One more time, let's say this together. And I pray that your love will have deep roots. I pray that it will have a strong foundation. May you have power with all God's people to understand Christ's love. May you know how wide and long and high and deep it is. And may you know his love even though it can't be known completely. It truly is an audacious love that God has for you that he pours into you and flows out of you into others.
my courage in the fight. I hear you call my name, Jesus, I am coming, walking on the waves, reaching for your life. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.